it's always, um, it's always good to see, but um, particularly at the moment, we, 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 the democracy commission that Kurt Peters is holding is, uh, is extremely timely, not only in the context of what's happening in England at the moment in terms of uh, regional devolution and localism and the way in which local government is being remodeled by central government in the main, but, uh, but also in terms of uh, what's happening with some particularly the European Union referendum. We, we live in interesting times and um, in many ways it raises questions about what local democracy means at the moment. And I think that Kirk needs, needs to be congratulated um, not only for supporting the idea of the democracy commission but also for the four political parties associated with the council itself, representing the council itself, for them more to get behind this. Um, I think really just just show that they are not only committed to looking at their own practices, but also thinking about how they take to look at democracy forward when we go to 2020, which is really you know, the basis around this. Um, and in that context, what's been happening over this summer has been the last month we've been uh, holding a series of uh, consultations with local citizens, getting their views on how they feel about local democracy, and also giving many ideas. It's been, um, it's been genuinely rewarding. I think I can speak for us all by saying that the ideas that have come from local citizens show not only how, how engaged they are, but also in many ways how um, often we don't tap in to that. And then, you know, the invitation that's been extended to yourself is in many ways reflective of that idea that we are aware of the need to develop consultation approaches and to ensure that we engage with citizens in a, in a more sustained and meaningful way. Um, what will happen if after this month, this month we're holding a number of inquiries, we're we'll taking evidence in London, in Manchester, and back in Kirkley's as well as this. Um, we'll be drawing up a report, which will be published, a draft report, which will be published in the November. Um, <coughs> we're very keen to send that to people that are giving evidence, and that would be yourself to get your views on the recommendation to see to what extent we channeled your ideas and your views, uh, re they're reflected accurately, but also um, that what conclusions we draw uh, you feel are appropriate. So this is not simply a question of drawing you out from a beautiful day into a chilly room um, and then uh, not contacting you again. Um, but those recommendations will then be submitted to Kirby's Council, to the Council itself. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, will be disseminated widely by policymakers across, um, <coughs> across the United Kingdom. One of the things that we are very uh, rewarded by is the enthusiasm that people have uh, responded to what we're doing. Um, I wonder if you could just start off, you could just uh, introduce yourself formally to the, uh, the commissioners and then we'll introduce the commission on the table. Yes, do you want me to say a little bit about the organisation I come from? If you from could, that would be very kind, thank you. Um, so I work for a think tank and charity called Involve, and we specialise in public engagement in decision making between elections. Um, there are three strands to our work. So we do new thinking about, so about what public engagement could and should look like in various contexts and around various developments, so devolution being an obvious one. Um, we do better practice, so we support people around strategy design and delivery of public engagement so we get hands on on the ground a lot of us are professional facilitators so uh, we go right down to the detail um, and we do capacity building so we do training mentoring and advice um, around public engagement as well and we work with all levels of government so from and decision making so from the advice so the world health organization or ecd we've done work for them around public engagement and um, what it can look like through to working with government departments, uh, white and government departments, the Scottish Government, um, local health bodies, the NHS England Board, kind of all the way down through local councils and more locally with civil society organisations as well. Mm, thank you, that's really helpful. Yeah, and Council of Cena Fadio, elected member of Council of Cape Council and a commissioner. Council of Cape Scott, a member of the Democracy Commission. <coughs> uh, thanks, and working on the online engagement. Councillor Wilson, Governance and Democratic Services Committee. Councillor Andrew Paul Flynn, a member of the Commission. Andrew Marchie, a member of the Commission. And I'm just I'm Sarah Allen, and I run Involves People in Politics programme. So that's looking at specifically the issue of how to reconnect people with political institutions in the political process. 
and I look at that for, from two sorts of projects to do that. So one is starting from an institution's perspective, maybe a bit like this inquiry of, about mm. how could democracy be done differently from you, uh, looking at it like that. And the other one is to pick issues and groups of people who are maybe not being heard or that people who are <coughs> not being heard around and run bottom-up processes around those groups and issues. And a lot of my work is locally focused, and that's why I'm the person from Involve who's here today. Thank you, that's kind. Um, a nice simple start on question. <laughs> um, we've been talking to local citizens, uh, and one of the things which emerges has been the sense in which politicians uh, only really engage with the electorate around election time, and that there is a lack of sustained engagement in decision making, in just communication around the decisions that the council are making between elections. I just wonder, drawing on your own experience, um, if you could give us some idea about ways in which we could address that conundrum, which is about is how do you sustain the engagement between election cycles? So I think there's at least two different parts to that answer. So I think it is somewhat unfair on councils, councillors to say that they don't engage between elections because obviously you have mm. surgeries, you have all sorts of going out and visiting different groups meeting different people. So I think it is somewhat of an unfair criticism. Um, but there's also a reason this exists, because that is the rea reality of a lot of people's experiences. And so the quest, that's kind of, it's that perception gap and the reasons behind that that are really worth exploring. So two parts to that then. So the first thing is that I do think there is definitely space for more engagement uh, people's engagement in decision making between elections I think that's definitely true and for me that's about the council thinking about when it comes to make a particular decision who it needs to hear from in order to make that decision for the mm. informed because there's always different types of knowledge that are valuable to a decision so you have your expert knowledge but then maybe there's also the reality of someone's lived experience on the ground or lived experience of using a service and recognising that those different types of knowledge exist and then planning your engagement to access those different types <coughs> of knowledge is really important. And that requires thinking very carefully about the purpose of the engagement. So what is open to change? What can people influence? And then very carefully about your participants. So who is it that you need to hear from? So, you know, we do a lot of work in the health sector, for example. If you're redesigning a diabetes service, you need to talk to people who've been using that service, but also maybe people who are kind of pre-diabetic. If you just kind of think it through very logically, then it tells you who to engage around each decision. And I think the nice thing about thinking about it from like the perspective of each decision is that makes it issue-based. And a lot of people today think more in terms of issues that they're interested in rather than kind of political parties mm. and kind of platforms. So what you'll get is not everybody will engage with every consultation and every decision, but people will engage with the ones that they really care about and which they see as relevant to their lives. And that's a good outcome because you're getting the right people. How, how do you think the councillors and councils can filter that to, 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 to work out which are those decisions which matter most to, 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 um, to citizens? You know, how do they decide what to consult on and what not to? So I think there's two ways to do it. So one is looking at the decisions coming up from a council's perspective and thinking about which of those would most benefit from a different sort of knowledge, would most benefit. So if you've got um, a, an area plan or something like that, it seems quite important that you understand people's aspirations who are living in that area, mm. what they want their area to be. You know, so there's a degree of prioritisation from the council's point of view about where input is most important. And then you get the other sort of engagement, which is engaging with people not around a specific decision, but just your ongoing engagement so that you'll make sure you're identifying the issues that are important to people from the bottom up. And actually, that's one of the places where I think councillors' role can be really valuable. Because if you're going out there and you're talking to a wide range of groups, then you're kind of one of... The you're playing a role as sort a of community connector. You're hearing what the issues are that are most important to people, and there's that sort of feed-in through that um, to the council, hopefully. Um, and also you can obviously run processes specifically around the issues that are most important to people. So it is entirely possible to run 
an engagement program with a particular community, be that demographic or ge geographical, around the issues that are most important to them. If you feel like there's a group of people who really aren't being heard through normal representative processes, you can design a process specifically to understand what the issues are mm. from that community's perspective, and that can help with prioritisation too. Yes, this idea of community connector is an interesting one, isn't it? It sort of suggests a change in the role of local campuses to a certain extent from what their traditional role as representatives of the community are. Um, what kind of challenges might you see in that changing role for councillors as they move towards being more of a community connector? So I think it's a degree of culture change, isn't it? And, and culture change is, is always very difficult no matter how people do it. Um, I think there is another side, just before I answer that question directly, mm. I think there is another side to being more connected as well. So there's the overt kind of engagement in decision making and processes run to ensure that people's uh, views and priorities are being kind of surfaced. But then there's the other side of it, which is the sort of ongoing work of the councillors through the council's presence on social media, going to groups, mm. out to groups anyway, and just making sure that that's a two-way dialogue and also that you're using you're going to the groups and you're using the social media channels that, that people in the ward are using. So you're going to people, it's kind of overwhelming theme or overarching theme is going to where people are rather than expecting people to come to you and then making sure that that engagement is two-way mm. rather than you going to talk to them about this thing that's coming up, being able to have a more open-ended conversation with them about how things are going for them and what the emerging issues are for them as well. Um, mm. And I think, importantly, to differentiate uh, between voluntary and community organisations and mm. individual people. So there's also, you know, there's something here about making this achievable for the council. And it's possible to have, net, you know, to build up a network of community and voluntary organisations in your area who you can ask kind of well, which groups are already working on something so that you can go and talk to those groups or that you can go out to and ask them to engage the people that they work with there's two sets of knowledge. There's their perspective, which may be more policy orientated, depending on the exactly what the group is. And then there's the people that they work with perspective, and you want both. Um, but the voluntary community groups do have that ability to connect you with the people that they work with directly as well. And most of them are very receptive. We we find in an ask to connect them with people, but they don't necessarily get it very often. So they usually just get asked their perspective as an organisation rather than we'd like to have a conversation with the community that you work with, can you help us mm. organise that and that's, that makes it easier because that's a, you've got kind of a network and they're trusted and it's easier to recruit people and that sort of thing and that's often forgotten. Mm. Interesting. The bilateral easy. deliberative approach is, is yes. essential. Yeah. yeah. Um, you answered the challenges, so I think from a theoretical level at least there are at least three tensions between like representative democracy and participatory democracy that people usually come up with, um, which I don't necessarily see as tensions. I think they're more opportunities. So people talk about kind of the leadership role. You, know, you have an election, people vote people in with a particular agenda and they expect them to show leadership. So how does that square with the sort of thing that we've been discussing? Mm. And I would say that it's, it's very much complementary. So in an election process, you know, only a certain number of issues are talked about at a certain level of depth. So where your engagement between elections can come in is a sort of detail about how particular visions will be implemented or sort of detail under the pledges and promises that have been made, which is also where people's knowledge is really helpful because you need, yeah, but that, that's often where they've got most to add. Um, and also the issues that aren't covered at all, either because they just weren't a hot topic during the election campaign um, or because it's an arising issue. That wasn't on, you know, that, that wasn't on the table at the time of the election. So, providing that you're focusing the engagement on stuff that's genuine, genuinely open for change, and not stuff that the council is completely committed to doing exactly like this, because that's what they pledged during the election campaign. It actually, it's complementary. It allows people to feed into the bits of the local lo democracy that they otherwise wouldn't get a voice in. Mm, yeah, really. So that's is it, this is the sort of thing you wanted as the answer to mm. this question. So uh, then the other tension that we get talked about a lot is the tension between council control between elections. So you know, you're going out and talking to groups anyway, you're going out to 
uh, and you have surgeries anyway and involving people in decision making and again I think they're different things and they're incredibly complementary so if you think some of the things that councils already do very well are support for individual people support for particular issues um, that groups have raised um, and, but not so much about bringing different parts of the community together to discuss things in the same room and understanding the trade offs that they'd make when given a bit more information or hearing other people's perspective, that's a different sort of engagement. Mm. And that's what this involvement in decision making, depending on how you do it, can give you. And I think it also presents very much an opportunity for councillors. So first of all, um, councillors can be seen to uh, sort of lead on suggesting this type of engagement and, and encouraging people to have a greater voice, which is good. Um, councillors can also host events, kind of in, welcome people to events, and kind of get their, you can get increased profile, increased links with different parts of the community through this sort of event. It changes in perceptions about what councillors are. So, for example, um, the Department for Communities and Local Government did an analysis and evaluation of participatory budgeting initiatives uh, in England a number of years ago, and they found that people contacted councillors more after this sort of event because suddenly they saw the relevance of councillors to their lives, saw that the councillors were interested in their issues. And in fact, where um, there was sort of a broader point to the processes, which was also about telling people more about voting in the political process, turnout increased quite significantly as well. So if you're doing this more engagement, you're sort of demonstrating to people that it is relevant, you're demonstrating that councillors are relevant, and there's a huge profile opportunity there for councillors mm. as well. And the third tension I think that we often get talked about is different types of accountability. So elections, you know, you, you elect people with a particular agenda and then you can get rid of them next time, more or less, uh, depending obviously on the exact, uh, how, uh, the, what the election results are on the electoral system and so on. Um, you can get rid of them next time. So how does that translate how, how does that relate to kind of this engagement that happens between elections? So again, I think it, it's massively complementary. So it's really important to have that elected person there who is responsible in the end for the council's actions, for the general direction that the council is taking. And you have to be able to get rid of them. I mean, that's, uh, I think, an essential part of democracy. But there's an, also the type of accountability which is really important to a robust policy-making cycle. And that's the kind of okay, we're trying this change to say transport policy, we'll get your feed into what, what you see the issues are, how you think they could be resolved, we'll tell you what we're going to do, and then we'll come back to you in a year's time and ask you, actually, has your experience improved at all? Is that working? So what you get from the electoral bit is kind of an overall accountability for the council as a whole, and what you get from the engagement between elections is more specific accountability and feed into specific policy decisions which is just helps with yeah. helps with developing good policy and there's no reason for there for those to be in conflict mm. yeah. especially if you're, if you're doing the engagement around the issues that didn't come up in the election in the first place if you see what I mean or around the implementation of the policy interesting that the, 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 that sort of annual accountability is something that came up from some of the citizens Engagements with people, they would like that kind of sort of rep that they have with the time. Yeah, um, going back to involvement, I mean, as, um, as councillors, we all understand we need to get involved and get, get engaged with our communities, and we do that on a day to day basis as much as possible. In the kind of financial situation most councils are in at the moment, all we've got is bad news and sad news. Sometimes we haven't got any good news to hear. And what, we, what I've seen, or what I think most of my colleagues have seen, is we always end up giving out, oh, we can't do this because central government's done this, we can't do this, and they feel that they are getting themselves disengaged. We, we feel that they're disengaged with us purely because we don't really have power of anything. Yeah. So they, they don't want to communicate with us because we don't, we're not in control of anything really. So I think that's, that does have a, a big play in that. What do you think of that? I think that's true. It's always easier to engage people when you have the ability to change the thing that you're engaging with people about. I think there's various things that you can do around that. So first of all, if, if you're running a sort of, uh, you're talking more about what the issues that people come to you with spontaneously. 
So yeah, with Mail, where you're running a process, if you are very clear about the parameters of the process to start, you know, it can cover this issue and this issue, but not these ones because we don't control that. Then you get people to feed in within the areas that you can. Because it's always very important to manage expectations, otherwise you can <coughs> have a great process and people always will still be disappointed. Yeah. Um, but I think you, you can also engage people around the challenge. So there's a great example from Melbourne um, where they were not in a dissimilar situation in terms of budget cuts. Uh, they didn't phrase it quite like that. It wasn't phrased as about the cuts. It was something around um, how can Melbourne still be the, a really great place to live in in 10 years' time was, was the question. Um, and they used a combination of a technique known as the citizen's jury where people look at information in a lot of detail and then something called pop-up democracy which means you go out to where people are, so shopping centres, meetings, um, to get a whole range of feelings about people's ideas for how what could change and what was important to them and what wasn't and that citizen's jury came up with a set of recommendations for what should be done with the budget and actually all of them got accepted and I know it, it, obviously they had a lot of information that was fed in to that process but that's a way that you can engage people in a difficult situation not suggesting that you'd necessarily do exactly that on that big an issue in Kirk Lees but maybe it's something place based maybe it's about um, you know how can we make this area a good place to live in in 10 years' time? And it, you know, the council is there and the CCG is there and the police are there. Or, you know, a joined-up approach, talking to people about the realities of the situation. And also then, you know, if you think about it as an asset-based approach, so, you know, the community has energy, it has resources, it has, you know, a lot to offer potentially in solving some of these problems or helping, helping things work better. So mm -hmm. if you engage, it's about framing the engagement in the right way and asking people to get involved at an early stage. So instead of coming, you know, we've got to shut this hospital or we've got to shut this care centre, you're engaging them at the point where it's like, well, we've got to think about how social care in this area is going to run in 10 years' time. This is the reality of the situation. Now let's talk about what's in, start with what's important to you what's working well, what's not working well at the moment and kind of move people through the process with you, so I guess that's co-production but yeah, the more people are engaged earlier on, the more they don't feel constrained by having to react to a particular option like a particular decision that's already been made, the more they feel, the more they mm -hmm. understand where you're coming from and the uh, challenges that you're facing and the more they'll feel they've had a chance to input mm. So it is that proactive rather than sort of serving it as a fait accompli, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So serving it as a fait accompli is pretty much the worst, the worst, <laughs> the, the worst thing you can do, I think, because then people feel like you haven't consulted them. Um, See Greater Manchester Council combined as answer for details. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's no point in engaging them early if you're not going to. I think if there's nothing that's open. To they have to have agency. They have, have, there has to be agency. Yeah, you have yeah. to be. I mean, people are reasonably sensible. If, you know, if, if there is no other option, they'll generally conclude that there is no other yeah. option. I mean, but 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 you might. You mean you've said you've had like really great ideas from people that you've engaged during this process. It can be very surprising that what ideas people come up with that people haven't thought of before, simply because they're not in an institutional box. They don't have to think mm. about something mm. from the council's perspective or from the. CCG's perspective, they're just thinking about it from the perspective of the citizen. They'll come up with all sorts of things that people didn't mm. think about before. Because I, I want to come back at the end to a comment on the, the intentions and stuff. This, this stuff about the consul, that word consultation, yep. just follow up it. Because again, one of the issues we have, and health service, I'm interested with your experience working with the health service because the consultations that happen to happen in our areas, it's the type of consultations. This is what we want to do. What do you think about it? Yeah. It's an information type consultation as opposed to an a more open ended consultation where yeah. actually this is an issue we'd like to deal with. What do you, you think about it? Yeah. Um, and it's, I think that's really interesting what you talked about that actually being more open ended, actually giving people an opportunity to influence different mm. outcomes would be really useful. I think that's if we pick up some of that as well. But the other thing I want to talk um, We've had conversations with other people presenting evidence about how they engage with 
different groups. Yeah. So you've talked about it's like communities of interest. Yeah. Um, we did that a bit of a question about expert patients. Um, the, the issue is about bias and represent are those groups representative? Yeah. So um, how do you make sure that even so if you've got a say a diabetes support group yeah. and that's the issue, how do you make sure that you're getting a representative even though you're getting engaging with a group that's got you know expert knowledge of the condition and stuff, it's still does that represent everybody with um, health issues around diabetes? It might be another health issue. Yeah, I mean, so there's various ways around that. So um, I reviewed a clinical commissioning group's patient engagement, public and patient engagement strategy uh, recently, so yeah. uh, it's quite relevant. So I think your first question is, if you have worries about whether a group of patients has become experts, then recruit more widely. Mm. You know, go out through doctors' surgeries, go out through mm. other people who work, have contact with people who have diabetes, and, and just get a, get a source of get people from a, from other well, places. Yeah. Um, the other way you can do it is to ask pe the people who are experts or who are more in touch with the council to act as community champions or patient champions. Mm -hmm. So you get them to help shape maybe a questionnaire or a set of que interview questions or an event, well maybe quite a questionnaire mm -hmm. or interview mm -hmm. questions, and, you know, and then you ask them to go out and reach out to other people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. you know, so you don't so that you're using them, their connections to widen out. Yeah, and, and there can be some advantages to that. So, um, actually, Andy already knows about it, but I'm about to start a project. I don't know if you know we've got, you know, we've got the funding, but um, I'm about to start a project on young people and mental health um, mm -hmm. in Oldham, um, and that's youth-led and peer-to-peer. So, actually, I'm also not starting with... Yeah. A, uh, in this case, I'm not starting with a youth council or a group of young people who are already... in engage I'm, I'm going to start with a new group of young people that I'm going to bring together but the principle is the same that I'm going to work intensively with a group of around 20 to 25 young people but I'm going to get them to design the outreach with with some support that goes out to a much bigger range of young people in the area and they're going to so run that the event. How are you selecting that or how is that group of young oh, people I'll come to that in a second but the <laughs> advantages the advantages of doing it like that is that the young people are likely to be more honest with the other young people than they would be with me and also that it means that the engagement is going to be framed and communicated in a way that the young people identify with whereas I might accidentally use jargon or ask a question that the young people just doesn't doesn't relate to their mm -hmm. experience despite my best intentions and best efforts to get the framing a bit right because you know it's a while since I've been a young person and I've never been a young person growing up in Oldham and you know, like, I'm aware that I'm out of date. So people can have a valuable perspective on how to reach other people in their peer group. Um, in this case, I'm recruiting through the voluntary uh, and statutory sector. So there's a, there's a, a very basic plain English application form. Um, I'm reaching out to organisations saying we're looking for people, young people with a strong interest in mental health. And people fill out, they're allowed to have help in filling out the application. A very, it's a very simple application form mm -hmm. and then we'll do an informal telephone yeah. interview but we're reaching out through um, youth offending teams, through care homes, through young carers organisations, through youth homeless organisations so the groups who are likely to be at biggest risk of poor mental yeah. health for this particular project because that's the aim of the project yeah. if you see what I mean, yeah. that's the right group for this project I think the other thing that's really interesting in your presentation is about you're talking about capacity building. Yeah. So you've got you find somebody who's really passionate about yeah. a particular issue. Have you worked, but the barrier then is how they then engage with a public service yeah. um, and actually enable equipping people to actually engage with the processes that are involved. So you've got examples of where is that the sort of capacity building? No, so I meant it the other way around. So oh, I meant capacity yeah. building within organisations to enable them to offer people the right, right. opportunities that will enable them to engage yeah. rather than capacity building amongst the public yeah. to engage although we will do that so like through the, this young person's project we'll, right. we'll help them with their facilitation skills and their communication skills yeah. and that sort of thing. Give an example you might want to comment on it so we've got a um, uh, corporate parenting board which yeah. looks at how it does corporate parents and fostering an option yeah. and we've got a member of the book who actually chairs the um, fostering support group yeah. 
and she's really keen. But the first meeting she came to, she was quite worried <laughs> about it because yeah. lots of people, you know, that you've got the director of children's services yeah. there and everything. And it's like, yeah. And one of the things I th thought was that she'd be, she'd be really, because of her experience of fostering, yeah. really good to tap into that experience. Yeah. But she's then a link between another group of fosters. Well, it's about, is it poss you know, possible to actually develop her skills and support her so that she still remains somebody, a primary friend who's about fostering and that, but actually, so she can help to tap into that little area of range of expertise for her to be a link. Yes, it is. It isn't just about developing her skills, it's also about developing the skills of the people in that meeting. Yeah. To engage better with her, it's a two-way. Right. Okay. So it's a whole stick of yeah. So the whole process. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. We could do that. It would be a, yeah, through training is how we would. Do, I mean, you could support her internally to kind of. You could offer her support to to understand you know the various policy contexts and issues facing. Yeah. You, you know that were relevant to her role. I'm sure you could find someone internally to. To do that. Mm. to talk to her about it but then there's a question about why that meeting yeah. is so inaccessible to because her. It's, it's formal, <laughs> well, it's like, well perhaps it's very about what about lots of our meetings they're open and there are opportunities for them but you still you, you come into a room and there's, there's offices sat at the front there's a chair there's a whole group of yeah. councillors around and you're, so, it's like yourself that you're sat yeah. facing the camera. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think there is a question. So it is always useful, I think. So patient engagement groups often do this as well. So it is very useful to have a patient on all the meetings because it keeps those meetings focused on the, in this case, the foster carer's experience or the patient's experience. It's good to have them follow a decision all the way th through. Um, but then there's also a question of whether you should be engaging not just this particular foster carer but other foster carers in other parts of the decision-making yeah. process mm -hmm. as well. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... Well, but yeah, no, that's interesting. The extra bit is about what we need to do to meet, yeah. to meet both ways. I realised there was a couple of things I didn't say earlier as well. So when you were talking about, you know, your worries about whether people are representative, so that you're not necessarily around um, a particular patient, you know, your diabetes support yeah. group, is it representative? So all the things I said before stand, um, but there's also, you, you're not asking these people to make a decision. Therefore, you don't need them to be strictly representative in the way yeah. that you might want a citizen's jury to be strictly representative if you're, you know, you've got 12 people who are meant to be representing the whole community and you need to think about the makeup of that quite carefully. In this case, what you're doing is you're looking for information to inform a decision from people with a different perspective. Mm. And so whether or not you've represented every single possible bit of the diabetes treatment spectrum, whether there are other people out there who'd have a slightly different perspective, you're still going to get, you know, you're still going to get valuable information out of that about their experience of patients, mm. which is useful to understand while you're making whatever decision it is that you're making. So, the, yeah, depending on which engagement method you're using, depends how strictly representative the people. Yeah, the context of the means needs to be. Making sure that people aren't excluded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're not missing something you might be doing. Otherwise. Yeah, I mean, you just need to. So, so involve has a, like a nine-step approach to planning public engagement, um, and that will I, I can send it yeah, to you if, if it would yeah. be useful. Yeah. Um, but it, one of those things is thinking very carefully, as I said before, about who it is you need to hear from to make a decision, and so providing your kind of hearing from people from those groups, some people from those groups, you mm. don't need to worry too much often whether you, you know, you've... The methodology doesn't always need to be pure to the extreme that you have to have pure representation yeah. of every, and it depends on the nature of what you're actually consulting yeah. over and interacting with. Yeah, yeah. you're going to get more out of talking to, but it's better to talk to five patients and talk to no patients. You know, five people with diabetes and talk to no people with diabetes, That's true. for example. Just to sort of move on a, um, a little bit, and a little bit. One of the things that has come up with our consultations, both with stakeholders and with, um, certainly with local citizens, is that there is an issue around communication, both communication in the sense in which the way we 
local authority and councils communicate with citizens at what time and what ways and what kind of information they are seeking. And there's a disjuncture here. There's quite clearly a distance between those, um, those two things. And it's only from your own experience, and you, know, you obviously you know, involve consult widely with citizens on different... You know, how can that issue around communication be addressed? Have you got any examples of where good practice is ever? So communication... In, in terms of actually connecting with citizens, and it sort of goes to sort of what Andrew sort of suggested, you know, how do you actually engage with citizens, in you know, what formats, what form? So, so, yeah, okay. so, so it depends who it is that you're trying to engage. So if you go through a nine steps kind of approach, it's kind of what's the scope of your engagement. So, for example, that might be very obvious to you, but not very obvious to citizen so you might know that it's just about the bit of the ledger services that the council controls and all these other bits are actually privately controlled and you don't have any influence over them or actually this this bit over here that could be seen to relate to these yeah. ledger services actually that's parks and actually that's a slightly mm. different thing and that's not mm. part of this consultation so that but citizens won't understand that so you need to be very clear about that with them from the start so you're clear on your scope you're clear on your purpose um, about what you're trying to achieve with the consultation and what knowledge it is that citizens have that you'd like to hear, what it is that they know that only they know that you don't. So about their experience of using a service or living in an area. Um, then you know, it's things like outcomes and outputs that you want to achieve, who you need to hear from. And then depending on who it is that you need to hear from, you then pick your engagement method, you pick your communications channels, you pick your communications messengers, you pick your language you, you think about how you frame the issue so that it's going to start with where people mm. are at. It, if you ask people a sort of highly technical question or you know, very much you need to be a policy expert to answer it, well, first of all, you're not asking them the information that they have the knowledge mm. about to be able to contribute. And secondly, most people won't be able to answer it because they don't have won't understand the question potentially you know they won't have the noise they might not understand the question because the language is inaccessible if you've put it on your website and that's the only place that you've put it they'll probably never see it in the first place so hence why like if, if I'm doing so there's lots of examples where it's been done well so you know for example around around young people to continue with the example organizations like bite the ballot like leaders unlocked they do their work really well. It's all about young people, so they'll be using. You know, they often get young people to create their content for them. So then they'll use. They know which social media channels it is. They'll look at it and go, "I don't understand that," or "That isn't how we frame that," or "I'd ask it like this." Mm. Just thinking about it, thinking about it from that who you want to reach perspective. And if you don't know, ask someone who's who's from that community or from that demographic mm. about how to how to do it and, and think laterally, think networks, you know, who is it who's already in touch mm. with these people who could help us with this or help communicate the message. Yeah. I, I mean there are lots of examples of where it's been done. Mm. Well. Yeah, I, I think particularly with young people, it's interesting you, know, you, you draw attention to that. You know, one of the things that is apparent is that young people are um, if not different in their forms of communication, they are changing in their certainly there is a disjunction between older citizens and younger citizens. Okay. Um, and particularly, you know, in terms of using smartphones and using internet and whatever. Yeah. I just want to your experience. How, you know, how can, how can Kirklees, you know, embrace that connectedness uh -huh. and engage better with younger, young, young, young citizens, even those that haven't got the vote? Um, so, uh, there was a kind of sample question about young people and smartphones that was sent to me kind of in Right. Prepare, so like that question made me excessively nervous uh, for, for a number of reasons. So first of all, um, it talked about a sort of technology up front, which sort of implied an assumption that this mm. form of technology was part of the answer, when in fact it might not be. And then it, it, it talked about, so, so instead of starting with the technology and assuming that technology is part of the answer, I'd start with the problem. So the problem is that young people aren't engaging in voting or they're not engaging in decision making or you don't feel like you're hearing from young people when you should do. So then 
how do you start to answer that? So first of all, you want to understand the barriers that are stopping young, or the perceptions that mean young people aren't engaging. So they're not engaging. So they're not voting, for example, because uh, they don't know where the polling station is to keep losing their polling card and they think they need it. Or is it because, you know, they don't feel they understand enough about the candidates and issues at stake? Or is it because they just think the whole of local decision-making is completely irrelevant to their lives? And then making sure you're tailoring your answer to the one of those or two of those, or three of those, that is the case. Then I think it's a question, so once you've identified what the barrier is to participation, then it's about thinking about, well, what, what's the best thing we could do to overcome that barrier? So if young people think that this local decision-making is irrelevant to their lives, and you need to think about a way to demonstrate that actually it isn't, it's very relevant to their lives, and that, yeah, there's a whole range of ways you could do that. So one is to do engagement with young people, with youth groups, with young people, or you know, through organisations who are working with young people about what are the issues that bother them, feeding in an understanding of what it okay, because those are the issues, these are the ones that the council work with. Who what are your views on these? And you could do that or your, if you have a youth council, your youth count you could do that through your youth council, um, potentially. Yeah, so that might be one way to do it. Something like that, where something actually changes as the result of what they're saying, is probably better than just going into schools and telling them that it's relevant. Mm. You know, like it's an active demonstration of the fact that that the council has the power to do something about what the, about the issues that they care about. Um, so again, I think starting by asking young people, yeah, give give, the, give this problem to a group of young people from Kirklees. Mm and ask them how they do it and get them to engage their peers. Can, can I just ask that? So yeah, like, uh, that's a really yeah. important point that you've made. So are you suggesting that the youth council would be the way to go with it or go to other young people? Because so they're already participating. And that, because I find sometimes that the rest of think it's great, it's a closed group. Um, yes, so, so you, that's a very legitimate criticism of youth councils. So the uh, problem with youth councils is they're a fantastically developing experience for people who take part in them, but they only reach a very limited, mm. or can only, depending on how they're operating, can only reach a limited number of people. Um, the other problem with them is that depending on how you recruit and how you're pitching the council's work, you might get the people applying who would have got involved in decision making anyway because the kind of model of how the council works is inherently attractive to them if you're asking youth council to kind of simulate the workings of an actual mm. council you're getting the young people for whom that whole thing is inherently attractive and something that they want to be part of so you could do it with a youth council if you thought they were sufficiently representative of the rest of the youth population in the area because you could get them to design outreach activities for other young people but I would be more tempted to get a group of people who weren't the youth council to do it and to get them from groups to frame the question, so how do we get you know, young people have a, a voice on issues they care about in the area, so, and then to recruit from through organisations so you, you get a group of young people who wouldn't normally put themselves forward for that sort of thing and then get them to design the engagement. So the engagement is designed by young people who aren't necessarily that engaged. Do, does that make Yeah, it, it makes absolute sense, because I think one of the things that we don't tap into is that there's churches, mosques, synagogues, things like that, and they're regular meeting points of congregations and people that are there quite regular, that we don't tap into that resource. It's, it's continuous, isn't it? People are coming through the churches, mosques, synagogues, and everything. And, and for me... I think that there's a way of tapping into it also, I think it's likely to be. And there are techniques that you can use to do that specifically, yeah. so you yeah. can do, um, so, so our, our project in Oldham works like that, but in that case we're going out and running all the events that, you know, so, so we're not, I don't think we're going to reach out to faith organisations for that one, but that's a, you, that, you definitely can do that, we're doing, as I said, youth clubs, young, youth offending teams, yeah. schools, yeah. care homes and so on. Um, but so yeah, I, I think, think you can... 
sorry, I think they've got to look beyond about the religion. It's not about the religion, it's the people that are there. You could captivate an audience that are there. Oh, completely. So, yeah. But, yeah, and then yeah. sports clubs and, do, and actually yeah, different, and different yeah. things. Yeah. Um, but you can either run the engagement yourself or you can do something which is called a distributed dialogue so that you have like an engagement plan. And yes, you can run some of the events themselves, but you can also turn that plan into a pack and give it to organisations who work with young people, who'll be meeting young people anyway, and then they run sessions for you, collect the information and yeah. give it back to you, and that's a less resource mm. intensive way of achieving yeah. some of the same but outcomes. It, yeah, it's interesting, what, I mean, as I understand it, our youth yeah. councillors, the work that's done with them is it's not just about their views, that they are tasked, they have done some of the design yeah. in the year, yeah. because you've got, well, I mean, I think so as we said, it's mainly second. So you've got 95% of your children from the age of 11 to 16, and the college is involved in that. Yeah. And they've been really good about it. It's not just about their views and yeah. stuff like that. There's also Green Ice involved in cities and equally as it was, do try to re, you know, we do um, area forums and stuff like that. And it's, the, the battle we had years ago was it was the difficult to reach groups that we always went for. And there's a whole bunch of people who were yeah. willing to do that. Um, I mean, you I think the other thing, just to go back to the faith group stuff, um, Sacre, uh, the Standing by the Council for uh, actually had a, they used to do a youth Sacre and get young people to talk about. And it was fascinating to hear about their engagement with their own faith community. Mm. You've got young people saying, well, we find it very difficult to engage with our. But actually, it was a really good group of youngsters to talk to because they were talking about it in different, you know, clearly barriers to them engaging in the way they would want to do it. It was a different, interesting forum yeah. for them to, to find things out. And going back to your question, you, so the, the initial question I got sent was, was around uh, the amount that young people engage through their smartphones. So, once you've decided how you're going to do it, there, there is then this question yeah, about going out through the right channels and so on. But um, I would say that the most obvious observation about smartphones in particular is to mobile optimise your websites because because a smartphone isn't a channel, it's a device. Yeah. So if most young people are accessing online through their smartphone, mobile optimising your website is the one thing that you should do. Um, but beyond that, you know, it, it's what are they using that this device to do? I mean, if, if they're using it to kind of access social media channels mm. anyway, then, then actually it's about social media and it's not yeah. about the smartphone. Yeah. Um, and sort of where I was heading with it, you could see that someone would come along to you and go, you know, young people are on their smartphones all the time and they don't vote very much. And so what we think you should do is create a smartphone app that tells young people kind of where their polling station is, maybe some information about the candidates and all that sort of thing. And depending on what the barriers to your young people are, actually it might be the right thing, but you could also envision a situation where nobody downloaded the app because they weren't interested enough in voting in the first place download it and it wasn't advertised in the right places or they did download it but actually that wasn't the problem in the first place so it made no difference so it could sound very logical but actually just be a very expensive white elephant which is um, why I'd ask the young people YouTube YouTube sort of I mean when I speak to my eldest about the referendum so he's 15 now yeah information he got independently was on YouTube, so it was the, the, um, the truth about Europe, the UKIP type thing, which is just, I'd, I'd watch, which was absolutely horrifying, but a lot of the other stuff was on there, so actually that, you know, the talking head type stuff, and but that's how you access it, it's just... I would know. say if you do get a group of young people to look at something, like you don't, there's no, they don't have to start from scratch, so you have a youth council, they've done some engagement maybe around these issues already. In my mental health project, there is a youth council, they have done a bit of engagement, yeah. some engagement around mental health issues already. So you give that information to the young people when they're deciding where to focus their work and ideas, because there's no need to look at them. You want to give them information as well, right? It's about their views and experiences, but you want to give them useful information that will be useful for them in planning what they do. So mm. give it to them and then they'll focus what they do on the gaps or the bits that they don't think, well, you know, potentially the bits that they don't think are right, but they'll probably focus it on the gaps or the missing information, and then and then you, you get the best use out of out of your time as well, rather than just repeating. repeating. Just take home, because one of the things about that interaction is, is that the young people need to be informed. Right? They need to have mm -hmm. a certain level of literacy before they can engage in this co-design, co-production mm -hmm. approach. Uh, and, and one of the things that's very clear is, is that many young people aren't 
taught about local government, local democracy, mm -hmm. it's overlooked in citizenship education programs mm -hmm. and uh, and often in the media and, and in other sources of information, you know, it's peripheral. And I wonder whether you, in your own experience you give us any ideas about how we could address that potential shortfall in political literacy amongst young people about local democracy and local government. Mm -hmm. Um, so two main thoughts on that. So involved doesn't doesn't work actively around <coughs> kind of policy issues around political education. So personally, mm. I'm very strongly in favour of much beefed up political education in schools, so that everyone has you know, gets a chance to learn as they're growing up about how the system works and has an equal chance mm. to access it. Therefore, or, or you take, remove one barrier to equality of participation and equality of access. Um, but I would actually question how much you need to understand the workings of local democracy to engage in some of these processes. So it would obviously be, a, it would be better if all young people understood um, how to access their counsellor and how to access a counsellor's mm. surgery. But for example, some of the most effective young people's engagement I've seen on a local issue was the work of an organisation called Leaders Unlocked on Youth and Crime, Youth and Policing, and they're working with police and crime commissions, working with um, young, you know, young offenders, groups at risk of offending, and, and so on. Um, and the young people didn't need to understand how to influence through formal processes, because actually this was a separate process, and what they needed to understand was their experiences of the police in the local area. Then they needed some, we did do, the, the leaders and did do skills training around kind of how you engage other young people people and around public speaking but they were able to share their experiences, engage up to 2,000 other young people in their local areas do the analysis of those results and present them to an event with the police force, with the police and crime commissioner other key stakeholders which then in many cases have led to changes in decision making without understanding how local democracy per se works right. so I think Yes, I would prefer it if, if young people understood more about the influence points, but mm. also maybe that's not the right place to start. Maybe the right place to start is around the issues into which you'd like young people to feed in and then design a process which is accessible and, and doesn't have a knowledge, a knowledge bar barrier to it. Mm. Any more questions? Andrew? Well, no, I remember talking to our youth council years ago about about saying, "Well, t how do we get our hands on the levers of power?" And say, "Well, I don't have my hands on the lever of power at the moment. It was about what are the issues and how do you influence the mm. councils when we're not involved in decision making, where influence the decision making. So, like, what are the issues? How can you communicate what the issues are?" Just to be I just make, I did make a comment that you took the, the, the tensions and the um, opportunities you talked about about councillors yeah. heading up on things and I think that is really important because one of the phrases we were taught is that officers advise, councillors decide and sometimes what happens is you, if it's a difficult thing, you have an officer up at the front and we hide behind them and I think that's really unfair and actually we as a council have a different we should, you know, we should be up front because we're, you know, that you talk about community connector. So yeah. you're there to absorb, you know, you know, our community residents might be being really grumpy about something. They might feel, and we, if we absorb that, mm -hmm. and then um, that's part of our role to do. So I think that I'd really encourage, and we've got a slightly different that leadership role, step into those spaces to provide, build a bridge between communities, and um, you know, the way things work. I think is really. Mm. Just then you touched on there about you know people being unhappy about things and you needing to absorb that 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 is something we hear back quite a lot that people are nervous about and so maybe just to add that there are ways of designing events that you maybe don't yes. deal with quite so much of that. Um, so partly it's about where at what point in the decision making process you're engaging people. I mean you're never going to engage people around shutting a hospital and not get flack about it. Um, but. Um, you can, for example, so we did a whole bunch of engagement around the last election on, on how people would like to be engaged in local decision making, in mm. fact. Um, and we started off with a very simple exercise, which was getting people to write down kind of the first three words that came to their head 
came into their head when you said politics. <laughs> um, so hugely negative stream of words, and then we got people to kind of discuss a bit about it. And then we said, OK, so that's views of politics now. Now think about how politics should be. Write down three words that represent how politics should be and got people to discuss that and prioritise them. And then we carried on the whole event about so how in this frame of mind about how politics should be. So you'd given people the chance at the beginning to kind of let out all their negativity and you'd moved people Sleep. on yeah. to the positives. And there are whole loads of techniques like that. If you if you yeah. design events, you know, as involved does uh, and facilitate events kind of for, for a living, there's a whole a whole set of stuff like that which means that a lot of the problems that people that councillors and council officers uh, you know very reasonably worry about when they're thinking about public engagement you can just step around them um, right from the start which actually makes it a better um, a better experience for the participants mm. as well because it allows them you know to get to the meat of engaging with the, with the, the things that they can influence get their you know have their views heard but then move on no, no one wants to just be at an event where people you know it's a cognitive process. very negative you know yeah, all, all the way through <laughs> No, it is. It's, it's very important to have that sort of cognitive process where people do feel that there's a sort of pathway towards yeah, things. Yeah, it starts where they're at as well, doesn't it? It does. We've overrun again. Um, um, although I've not heard the buzzer of, of oh, doom. Oh. Um, um, <laughs> um, but um, thank you very, very much. That's enormously helpful. Um, I notice that you've got a very well developed chart. If there are things that you feel that you might want to add further, so yeah. we very much appreciate it because uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and you always bring uh, a very different view to things, which is very helpful. And that's been very helpful, I think, to us all. I think that uh, the way in which um, you approach that notion of cultural change is very interesting. I think it's it does shine a different light, and that's very much appreciated. This has become a sort of issue that's come up regularly, isn't it? There is a sort of step change taking place between one and the other. Uh, and this notion of community connector, which uh, I'm going to steal, um, is, is very interesting. This notion that, you know, within the context of that, I think that that's something that we'll be very interested to sort of explore in more detail. Um, as I say, we are going to um, spend. Well, September really, aren't we? We've decided. Yeah, you know, September is just going to be uh, us in rooms drinking uh, poor quality coffee. Sounds you. terrible. It sort of is in a way, and it's sort of also fascinating. <laughs> it's a very interesting process, and I'm enjoying it thoroughly because it's 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 it's, it's, it's a lot of questions which are often overlooked. But you know, this idea that this is bilateral, that this is a conversation, it's not just simply a question of us inviting you along, um, and then serving our recommendations of full content um, very much in the spirit of what you've talked about so we will uh, be contacting you and we'd be very interested to hear your views on the kind of recommendations that come on and uh, I certainly know that your connection with Kirby's Council and with myself means that we will be seeing you again yes. sooner rather than later and we'd be very interested to um, talk about some of the stuff you're doing in order I'd be very interested to see what you're doing with that but for the moment uh, I think we'd just like to say thank you very much for uh, thank you. for everything you. you're concerned. Thank you. Now, I do know that Diane. Um